Hey, DCF, Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a great weekend and are having a great start to another week on this Monday or Tuesday or Friday or whenever you're finally getting around to this video. Um, I want to encourage you as we start out this week, as we are seeking to pursue Christ together throughout the week, obviously, as we gather together in corporate worship every Sunday, and then as we scatter together into the places that God has placed us and called us to, to be agents of the gospel, to see the kingdom of God come as we seek to bring renewal and restoration and the good news of the gospel to bear on every sphere of life, um, our homes, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our marriages, our own self, a relationship with ourselves as we look in the mirror. Lord, we want to we want to pray that the that the kingdom of God continues to come as His will is done, and and that happens as we live out the gospel, proclaim the gospel in word and deed, in all of life. And so, as we do that together, as we pursue that mission together, even as we're apart from one another, uh, these videos are meant to encourage us as we as we pursue Christ. And that a critical part of that is spending time with Jesus. Um, no relationship is built without time spent together. Uh, it's just a, you, you can easily look at your own life and testify that that reality is true. Uh, if you have a relationship with someone, it's, it's because you spend time with them. If you don't spend time with someone, you might know them very casually, but there's no relationship there. And so as you spend time with God in his word and in prayer, let me just give you one thought to do as you pray, as you seek to listen to God's voice speaking, speaking to you through his word, this this whole section that we're in in the Heidelberg, side of Heidelberg, Belgian Confession is on the Word of God. Um, and, and the Word of God is the means by which God speaks to us. We're not looking for some private, um, subjective whisper or voice uh, coming down from heaven. God has spoken to us clearly through His Word. But as you sit down to listen to God's voice through His Word, let me just encourage you to pray a prayer for illumination. It's, it's the it's a big word that the church has used throughout its history, a prayer of illumination. It's praying that God would, that the Holy Spirit would, would speak to our hearts and that would open the eyes of our hearts and the ears of our hearts so that we can hear Him and see Him in His Word. And so one of the prayers that I often pray as I sit down to, to read the Word is, Lord, speak to me through Your Word. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to behold marvelous things from Your Word. Open my eyes, open my ears to hear what it is that you want to say to me today. Uh, remove any sin, remove any blinders that I might have on that would prevent me from hearing your voice speaking loudly and clearly into my life. So <clears throat> it's just an idea, a thought, an encouragement as you sit down to read the word and listen to God to first start asking and, and realizing that you need God's spirit to be working and active in order to hear his voice speaking to you. The, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, and so uh, consider praying those prayers before you read. Um, I'm coming to you today with Article 6 in the Belgic Confession. Again, we're in the section that's laying out the means by which we can know God, which is His Word. Uh, we can know Him through creation, but we, we put on the lens of Scripture uh, the scripture is our authority. It is the means by which God has spoken to us and revealed himself to us. And um, last week we talked about the authority of scripture and how it is that we know that the books that are contained within scripture are the very words of God, what makes them canonical, what makes them um, pass that measuring stick, that, that determination that they are God's voice speaking to us. Article 6 deals with the reality that throughout church history, not always has that been clear. Not always is that agreed upon between Catholics and Protestants, between Eastern Orthodox and Protestants. Um, and so there's this thing, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not, called the Apocrypha. Um, and there are these books that in the Catholic Bible exist between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think they would, they would say that they're part of the Old Testament. Um, but they, they would fill that gap of time that existed between when Malachi spoke as the last Old Testament prophet, uh, somewhere around the year 400 BC, and when Matthew picks up with the New Testament and um, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, those apocryphal books have some history, they have some 
uh, poetry. They have various types of genre contained within them. Um, but they are, uh, they are the books that some within the Christian umbrella think are canon, and, and those many do not. And so um, without reading all the names of them, you can read that on your own, the first paragraph. Um, I just want to point out that as Reformed Christians who, who subscribe to the Belgian Confession, the title itself tells us what we think about the Apocrypha books. The difference between canonical and apocryphal books. Okay, So that right there tells you we don't believe that the apocryphal books are canonical books. There's a distinguishing, there's something that distinguishes them from that which is canon, the, the Genesis to Malachi books of the Old Testament, those 39 books. Here's what it says. The church may certainly read these books and learn from them as far as they agree with the canonical books, and there's things that don't agree with the canonical books, and that's part of the reason why we don't see them as canonical. I'll say that in a second. But they do have such power, sorry, but they do not have such power, maybe Melanie can add that, that out for me, and virtue that one could confirm from their testimony any point of faith or of the Christian religion. Much less can they detract from the authority of the other holy books. So, the, um, the reformers were very clear that uh, the books may be read. We're not to, you, you don't have to say that they're, they're of the devil. They're certainly not of the devil. Um, they can be read. They can even be learned from. There are things in there that agree with Scripture, but they are not Scripture. They are not canon. They don't pass the test of what we said last week or what make the canonical books self-attesting as being the very Word of God. They're not written by the apostles. So let me let me just go through a few things in here that, that make them uh, not the word of God. They're not written by the Old Testament prophets. And they're not in Hebrew. They were written after, uh, somewhere around, somewhere between um, the 300 B.C. and 100 B.C. or even shortly uh, more recent than that. Um, they were not part of the Jewish Bible. The, the Jewish people themselves did not subscribe to them. They did not hold them as being canon. Uh, they were not even written in Hebrew. They were written in Greek. They were included as part of the Septuagint, which was the original Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament canon. Um, but they were written in Greek only. They weren't written in Hebrew. So these were not a part of Israel's history as a as a people, as the people of God, as Jews who wrote and spoke in Hebrew. Jesus and the apostles never quoted from these books. When Jesus in Luke 24, 24 says, he, he kind of summarizes the Old Testament. He says the law and the Psalms and the writings, or sorry, the law and the Psalms and the prophets, those three sections uh, as being what comprises the Old Testament. And, and the apocryphal books were, were not a part of any of those. Um, the early church fathers didn't recognize them as being canonical. Um, there's lots of writings from the early church fathers that, that rejected them as being on the same standard as the Old Testament prophetic books. Um, and, the, and that which was being accepted as the New Testament canonical books, as those letters from Paul were beginning to circulate and the Gospels were being collected and passed along as a four-part book. <clears throat> um, they're not historically accurate. There's lots of things... Um, within the Apocrypha that don't match up to, to history, to accurate history. Let me just read kind of one thing for you in case you're interested in that. Uh, for example, the book of Judith calls Nebuchadnezzar the king of Nineveh, even though Nineveh was destroyed years before Nebuchadnezzar's time. So that's just one example of historical inaccuracy. Um, and then there were teachings within them that contradicted the biblical faith and put forth more of a works-based Salvation, apparently there's there's texts in the Apocrypha that give the Catholic Church justification for purgatory. That's where they find some um, some justification for that belief. And so, so again, Christians are free to read them. Um, we can learn certain things from them, but again, they must align themselves with the Old Testament canon of Scripture and the New Testament canon. And the, the Bible itself is one continuous story. It never contradicts itself, and there are contradictions within the Apocrypha, 
and they prove themselves because they don't have those divine qualities, as we said last week, of being God's very word. Just, just another interesting tidbit. Um, and we sometimes I think we can think, man, 400 years of silence, that's a long time, right? Think about Israel in Egypt, right? There were 400 years of silence on their part uh, when God was not speaking to them directly. When they were slaves in Egypt, it was promised to Abraham, and I think it was Genesis 15, right? 400 years you will be enslaved by another, but God would deliver his people. 400 years of silence, Israel is in Egypt, okay? Somewhere between 350 and 400 BC, the prophet of Malachi is written, and boom, the canon is closed. And we get 400 years of silence, and the Apocrypha sort of seeks to fill that silence. But um, I think there was a parallel happening between the 400 years of silence that Israel experienced in Egypt before being delivered uh, out of slavery in Egypt by the Exodus, by the Passover lamb that covered their sin and allowed them to experience freedom as they passed through the sea, the waters. And now, after 400 years of silence, as God's people had returned back to Israel and rebuilt the temple and the city walls under um, Ezra and Nehemiah, after 400 years of silence, boom, uh, in comes the word, the word. And, and God speaks again, and he delivers his people again, not out of slavery in Egypt, but out of slavery to sin, death, and hell. Um, as, we, as we're covered by the blood of the Lamb, as we pass through the waters, not of the Red Sea, but of baptism, and we are delivered as a people. So, um, you know, people don't like awkward silence. We like to fill awkward silence, and the Apocrypha kind of seeks to do that. It fills in some of the gaps historically of those 400 years of silence, but it's out of those 400 years of silence that God has delivered a people out of slavery in Egypt and now out of slavery to sin, death, and hell by the blood of the sacrificial lamb who is Christ, our Passover lamb. Uh, to whom we give all praise, glory, and honor. Amen. Have a great week loving and serving your King, and I'll see you on Sunday.